Live from the Wynn Resort in Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering .next Conference 2016. Brought to you by Nutanix. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to Las Vegas, everybody. Mark Templeton is here, industry legend, former CEO of Citrix. Mark, really a pleasure having you on. Thanks, thanks, really great to be here. So, what are you doing these days? <laughs> Enjoying retirement, <laughs> all right? Uh, way more than I thought, but uh, you know, earlier today at the uh, Nutanix Next Conference, Mark Leslie, the legend, icon, uh, talked about the arc of life, and he had this one slide that said, there is no finish line, and I think anyone who is blessed to have work their career around their passion. Um, uh, that's, he just captured it all in that one slide. And so there's no finish line, it's just sort of continuing the journey with maybe some new uh, friends and colleagues. Right, no, no hammock, no umbrella drinks. Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh plenty, of, plenty, yeah. of, plenty of drinks. But it doesn't but, end there. But no, plenty <laughs> of drinks uh, as always, but no, no uh, hammock. And so, you, we heard your keynote yesterday, which was outstanding. You're spending a lot of time thinking about the future. Yes. Um, so you've got time to do that now. What are you, yeah. what are you seeing? What are, what's in the binoculars of Mark Templeton? Well, um, you know, a, a, big, a big thing for me is uh, people and um, how generations of people actually influence uh, changes in uh, our environment and, uh, and how they drive different ages uh, in the sense of uh, description of, of time. So I think, uh, you know, for me, I was born uh, analog, I'm a boomer, and boomers generally, you know, uh, born analog, but I fell in love with digital and it made it my career. My children are X, Y geners. Um, they were born digital mainly because of my career, but many in their generation were actually, you know, born analog, but learned digital pretty quickly. Right. Now millennials, you know, they're born digital and they're not interested in how things work from a computing perspective. They want to know what can it do. And so the question is now, what's, what's next? And as I sort of talk to a lot of millennials, uh, talk to a lot of companies that are out there with ideas, I've concluded that we're actually at the end of the digital age um, because we're on digital overload. There are too many devices, there are too many apps, too much data, too many social connections. I mean, no one can handle and manage it all. And the only way we can keep going in terms of leveraging technology to the benefit of humankind is for it to become invisible. And the way it becomes invisible is to take what we've accepted as analog uh, for a long, long time, uh, human emotion, relationships, um, location of people, intersections amongst people, et cetera, and start uh, creating context out of that through digital mechanisms. So I think this next, where things are going is uh, uh, away from digital toward contextual, and it's through contextual that we can actually um, have, uh, you know, greater experience with technology un un underneath. And uh, yeah, and, and tremendous opportunities for invention, innovation, et cetera. You asked the question yesterday of the audience, who's, who could program an assembler? <laughs> I put my hand up. I don't know if I still could, but I certainly have. But your point was that yeah. everybody who's programming today is, is, is programming an assembler, it's just invisible. It's invisible, that's right. right. Every layer of extraction makes the, the layers below invisible. And you know, that's one of the things I love about Nutanix because they're making cloud uh, infrastructure, hypervisors, kind of all this componentry invisible, allowing the focus on a common set of services that are exposed. And for a whole set of people, that's great, right? And that means you can move on to the higher layers of the stack. Same thing goes for contextuality. Contextuality will create layers of abstraction that, you know, when you enter the room, the right things happen. You don't have to think about, oh, I'm using uh, Lutron switches, or you know, or I'm uh, 
I've got a nest going on here. Did it move from away to home? You know, all of that, like, it becomes invisible and goes away. It's just early in the cycle of getting there. So, what do you see that having an impact on the, the jobs that are people having? You talk about, you know, moving up the stack, it's even in IT here and for Nutanix, it's, you know, oh wow, this is what my job's been for years and now I don't yeah. need to do that. I'm retraining, moving up the stack, there's lots yeah. of challenges. <clears throat> well, I think, I think history shows that every generation of uh, where there's a, a layer of abstraction that has lots of staying power, it, it, what it does is it separate, it takes a bunch of people and it says, okay, you stay below that stack and you're a specialist and you stay deep on it. I mean, let's face it, you put Nutanix technology in, uh, in place, you still ha you have to have deep specialists under that. It's just that the DevOps people don't, know, have, to, don't have to know anything about how it works underneath. The, uh, the business units don't have to know anything about that. And so they can take all of that stuff that's cluttering their time and mind and focus on the, the missions that are important to them. So I think, so it creates layers of specialization along the way, and then it pushes generalists up, up, up. And look, if, uh, I mean, I think the Nutanix team, I think, adequately talked about the notion of what do we do when we get time back, whether we're admins or whether we're CIOs or whether we're CEOs or whether we're just individuals? And I think that's where, you know, uh, humankind seems to not have a problem in consuming that extra time, whether it's recreational or maybe a ret more return to some of the basic values of uh, families and relationships or new levels of innovation and invention. I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of things that get done with that extra time. You um, don't, I infer from your talk yesterday, you don't, you don't like the term consumerization of IT. You used a different term. Yeah, you know, I actually, uh, uh, Jeff with uh, Slack um, made that point around consumerization of IT and he, said really it's about humanization of IT. You know, I think these terms serve purposes along the way, and I think that we're still in the process of consumerizing IT. It's just that the, the, the purpose of the consumerization is to humanize it. And the consumerization basically is making things, making the IT experience much more retail, right? Uh, where people get choice, uh, where they get self-service, uh, and they uh, and and IT organizations actually s describe themselves in a way uh, that where they're merchandising services that benefit you know the business. So so I don't dislike consumerization as much as I really like the idea of moving the the idea forward to humanization because that's the outcome you're looking for. The, so. Um, Square a circle for me, because you, okay. you said something that surprised me, the end okay. of the digital age, right? Mm -hmm. And you've you know, sort of yeah. defended that position, but I, I want to ask you about something like autonomous vehicles. Okay. I was talking to my teenage daughters the other day, and one of them made the point that you know, turning 16 is a symbol of freedom. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the, 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 the pieces of that freedom is you get to drive a car. Mm -hmm. and, and so, I thought you were going to say this is just the beginning of the digital age. What do you, <laughs> what do you make of, of that in terms of the impact sure. on society yeah. and its yeah. humanization of aspects? Yeah. Well, uh, so the end of the digital age <clears throat> includes, it's the end of the visibility of digital because it's just peaked out. And so it's, so digital sort of, you know, technologies around digital they're just becoming more and more and more invisible as machines do more work that humans used to do. I mean, why, uh, um, uh, here's a question, why is it so hard for older people to adopt new technologies? If they're so simple and they're so great, why do they have a hard time adopting them? Because they're complicated. They're complicated, right? <laughs> you know, uh, when, you're, when you're doing it over and over, 
you, you know, you don't realize how much knowledge you're applying to what something that something that's so simple, all right? So all I'm saying is the, the, the test will be when uh, a generation that's behind us can actually consume it in pretty ubiquitous ways. And so it's the boomerang kind of effect, right? Yeah. right? So Stu, you were talking about a little bit about the work that we did with the guys at MIT and Brynjolfsson and, and McAfee of the mm -hmm. second machine age. So do you mm -hmm. think much about, I'm sure you do, about the impact of machines? Machines have always replaced sure. humans. Yep. They seem to be now doing it at a cognitive level. Yep. Um, and and What's your, what are your thoughts on you know, education and you know, the state of education in you know, this, this country in particular? But. Well, you know, I've, I'm, I mean, there are two ways to answer that, uh, half full, half empty. You know, I'm an optimist, uh, and I think that uh, these kinds of things I'm talking about actually will serve to make education more personalized by individual. When I look at the things <clears throat> like Khan Academy, mm -hmm. right, and the impact that Khan Academy has made in public school systems, and you squint at it to, so that you only see the shapes and forms, here's what it's done. It's allowed the teachers to focus on the students by exception and where they, where they need help as opposed to mass kind of education, an entire classroom. That's been one of the big effects of, uh, of Saul Khan's work. So I think, um, and I, so I'm optimistic about machines, contextuality, and the intersection of all of that uh, when it comes to education, because I think the more context a teacher has around a student, what's going on at home, what, what's happening in other classes, extracurricular activities or lack thereof gives them a better ability to actually teach them and gives them a better ability to learn if the systems are, are set up to make that connection. And so, we're optimists too. I mean, I, I think you know, the, the observation is that the industry has marched to the cadence of Moore's Law for decades. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's driven innovation. And it's not driving innovation anymore. It's the combination of technologies and uh, we, think that creativity, you know, teaching, I don't know if you could teach creativity, I guess you can. I yes, guess you, you can. You know, why can't you, right? So, yes. And yeah. that seems to be the new frontier of, yes. of education, in our view anyway. Does that make sense to you? It you makes that? total sense. And by the way, you travel the world and you uh, characterize various uh, educational uh, methodologies and priorities around the world. What still, I mean, a lot of people throw rocks at, you know, the educational system in the U.S. is actually a system that promotes creativity more than any other educational system in the world, okay? You go to mm. certain uh, countries in Asia and they promote knowledge and, and just in knowing, knowing facts and being able to, you know, uh, uh, state facts and correlate facts, all right? And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that, it's just that it, you don't, you're not driving the cre a creative uh, sort of process, you aren't teaching creativity. So, uh, so yes, I'm optimistic about, uh, uh, about where we're headed in, in, in the sense of how this age of contextuality can actually um, propel us forward as a nation. Uh, around education. And that's too why you hear so much criticism about teaching the test. You know, you got the young kids and yeah. you hear a lot of that backlash. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So Mark, I, I want to go back. You talked a lot about kind of generations and journeys. When, when we look in the IT space, the, the, the pace of change is just faster than ever. You know, what yeah. advice do you give to, you know, how do you get, you know, it, by now, by the time you're relevant, you're almost irrelevant, you know, yes. soon after. So how, how, do you, how do you plan for that? Well, <laughs> So first of all, I think um, you, you always have to start with an opinion about the future that you believe in and so strongly that you're willing to make bets, okay? And some of the bets, you know, some, there are low risk bets, there are high risk bets, 
know. Mark Leslie talked about transformation, et cetera, today. And that's really about having an opinion about the future and, having the, and, and making a bet. So, uh, and he gave some great case studies, but if you look at those case studies, you ask the CEOs, the leaders there, they, 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 they didn't think they were high risk because you know, they thought the greater risk was not betting, right? And it's because of their opinion of, of the future. So I think you have to start there. Too many, my observation, opinion, is too many people r read too many books, too much of the net, and form their opinions based upon what they read as opposed to forming an opinion on their own through some amount of introspection and experience, okay? And I think that, uh, I'll give you an example. I remember, it was probably 1999, I was newly CEO of Citrix, and I had a whole faction of our dev team saying, Mark, it's all about WAP. <laughs> it's like, WAP? What do you mean it's all about WAP? It's like, it's all about WAP. I said, what's WAP? Well, it's the wireless, uh, I can't even remember what it stood for, like something access protocol. Yeah. Access <laughs> protocol. Yeah. Security stuff. So, okay, I said, fine. <laughs> All right, uh, let's meet on that like next week. It's like, okay, fine. So over the weekend, I go somewhere and I bought a WAP phone, a Nokia WAP phone that supported WAP. So I get on there over the weekend and you know, blah, 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 fine. I go to the meeting next week, sit down, and the whole team comes. It's all about WAP. Here's why I said, okay, let me, uh, let me start with a question can everyone show me their WAP phones? No one had one. And I pulled mine out and I said, you know, hey, let me give you a demo. And so, you know, you form an opinion about something and then you can, and so I, I said, we're not spending one nickel on WAP, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, so that, that, I think that's, that's the number one advice I would give because then when you have a belief uh, and a, an opinion about the future, you ha your bets are, you, you feel they're low risk for the right reasons. I want to ask you as a, a CEO, a former CEO of a public company, you heard Mark Leslie talk about mm -hmm. today the short-term focus. A lot mm -hmm. of people talk about that. Ever since I've been in the business, people, people talk about particularly U.S. companies, short-term focus, Wall Street, now you're seeing active, activist investors, maybe it's, gone to a new level. Um, yeah. I, I presume you agree, but it's worked. The United States is dominant and they've always had this short-term focus. Have we yeah. gone beyond a point, though, of rationality? Or? Well, <laughs> you know, there's a, I think this is a semantical problem. So I think I probably don't agree with Mark, uh -huh. all right? And uh, along the way when people said, well, how, you know, public CEO, go, you know, go with the PE guys, you know, do that. Well, why would I do that? Well, because you don't have the short-term focus, focus, like, you know, the quarterly thing, and it's like, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, right. You don't know PE guys, <laughs> first of all. all right. uh, secondly, um, I disagree because you're measured as a public company against the expectations that you set. So if you set the wrong expectations and miss them, then, you know, you're in trouble. <laughs> if you set the right expectations, whether those expectations are financial, strategic, operational, and you exceed them, there's no problem with it. And our system is successful because there's a quarterly rhythm to measuring um, the, ex uh, the, the path of companies that are public. And so there's no, there's no law out there that says uh, every time you measure, it has to be something you know, prescribed. It's pre it is prescribed. It's prescribed by the CEO and board. And the expectations that And the set. expectations that get set. So you know, I was CEO of Citrix for many, many years. Um, and uh, when I retired, it was my 70th uh, earnings report, all right? And I figured, uh, I figured, you know, 70 years in jail is uh, <laughs> enough, you know? I applied for parole a few times and it was denied. But uh, seriously, um, 
the, the, the idea of a quarterly report against the expectations you set is not a bad thing. Yeah, Michael Dell talks about the 90-day shot clock, but I'll bet you he has a 90-day shot clock internally. Sure. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Do you think, you know, I don't know if this is the case, but it seems to me that some of the companies that I observe today that are successful, in particular Nutanix, I, I would put ServiceNow in that category, Tableau, Splunk, mm -hmm. they seem to be highly transparent, maybe more transparent than I'm used to. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention before. Mm -hmm. Is that, have you observed that? And, um, or do you think it's just a function of their success and their size allows them to be more transparent than a? Um, you know, the large no, I think I think that um, I think the that's a big change that's taken place. So more newly public companies like Splunk, for example, mm -hmm. um, have to be more transparent around the core metrics they use to measure success. So if you look at some of the Success, like Adobe, a hugely successful transformation story. Um, they did it through obviously the right strategic uh, mechanisms to, to move to a, a different business model, right. but they had to create a level of transparency to get there uh, in order to successfully make that uh, transformation. Uh, companies like Splunk started there, right? And so that is the standard for a more of a subscription, cloud-based, SaaS-oriented type business model. And um, investors uh, reward that, um, uh, I think, and so therefore it's a, it, it's, it's a it, it confirms, it's like positive strokes to transparency, and I, which I'm all for. I wish we had more time to talk about things like culture, so many different, different topics, but we'll, we'll leave it at, you know, what's next for you? What are you spending your time on? Any fun projects that you're working on? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I'm spending all my time on technologies that um, increase contextuality. So, uh, for example, uh, one of them is a, a web psychographics company. So, you know, when you surf the web now, their web analytics really does more demographical kinds of things, right? But the science of psychographics actually takes a lot of that and actually figures out what's the why you know, your behavior, what's in your head. So I think that's a context that's important to, to add, again, to make, it, to make the technology more invisible. Spending time on uh, autonomic uh, security, security that actually not only uh, dynamically uh, sees attacks and, and, and discontinuities, it fixes them and then tells you later, okay? Um, spending time on uh, something that really exciting called human location analytics, uh, which basically is technology that can passively track human uh, motion um, and, and very precisely, so that as uh, people you know, occupy various spaces and have paths and interactions, um, systems around it uh, can respond. So like in a retail environment, you know, maybe if you're spending a lot of time at an end cap, somebody will come and help you. Mm -hmm. um, or, and if you combine some of these uh, things, uh, the psychographics and the human location, you know, you'll get the right kind of help and so forth. And that's all, that becomes all invisible and we just have a, a great experience. Combining so, innovations, right? Taking advantage of this yeah. invisible digital matrix. Yeah, and the thing that I'm, I'm really psyched about and most people that have known me for some time know that uh, I have a, a, a particular weakness with, for things that have uh, round rubber tires, okay? <laughs> so I'm um, deeply involved in a company uh, that, uh, an e-bike company that, uh, it's called Vintage Electric Bikes. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, the, it's an e-bike you, you love and you want to ride because of the joy that it gives you, all right? <laughs> So, so uh, yeah, so things that, you know, uh, greater context, so, so technology can be invisible, and things that um, bring out emotional kinds of pleasure and joy, that's where I'm spending my time, and I think they're, by the way, it's fun, which is my, the, the, the first bar I have. Number two, great people, the second bar, all right? And then the third bar is, I think that actually these things are uh, important for um, 
a better world and creating opportunity for people, et cetera, and I like doing that. Well, thanks for coming on theCUBE and delighting our audience. It was thanks. really a pleasure to have you. You look great, you sound great. And, thanks, uh, congratulations. Thanks. Having a great time. Thank right, you good. very much. Appreciate I appreciate it. it a lot. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest. This is SiliconANGLE's theCUBE. We'll be right back.